Hi, everybody. My name is Margo Speritus. I am a member of the Lamina One marketing team, and we are absolutely thrilled to be doing our first AMA with everybody. Um, I want to start off by introducing our co-founders, um, co-founders, um, Neil Stevenson and Peter Vesinus. And I'm just going to jump right in and, and hand the stage over to them. I know that they've been really uh, looking forward to speaking to the community. And then once they've done that, um, I will sort of give you all an overview about how this will work and we'll jump right in. So without further ado, um, Peter and Neil, please. Hey, guys. What you got, Margo? What do we want to talk about? Um, great. Okay, so um, everybody, thank you so much for submitting all the questions to our AMA channel. I'm going to just jump right in and we're going to do our best to work through this. So I'd say, Peter, our first question from and James Jay Sturavguri, um, what is the vision of Lamina One and what are the motivations inspiring its creation, Peter? The, you know, actually... As Neil and I were, were talking about in the fall, last fall, as uh, a couple events hit at once, like Facebook rebrand, Neil's birthday, um, and then it was 29th anniversary of Snow Crash, um, kind of in that, in that sort of mix, we were, we were talking and, and uh, I basically was like, are you happy? You know, are you, are you happy with what's going on? And I think, you know, he could speak for himself, but my vibe back was like, probably there's something to be done to bring about kind of like a truly open metaverse. Um, and um, the more we talked, the more I just thought, oh, well, we've got sort of Neil's vision, perspicacity, um, you know, sort of all of the cultural capital Neil brings and the knowledge and intelligence and wisdom. And then, um, and it turns out just from my own experience, I know a little bit about launching these sort of larger um communities ecosystems and so on in the crypto space and so it just seemed to me like we should do that we should try and build a place for uh people to people to go build out the sort of metaverse that they want to have to build it out outside of a corporate wall garden um you know i sort of look at right now the the metaverse players are just these huge tech conglomerates and or gaming companies and so um I don't know. I I just want something more culturally broad, not not just like, you know, California culture, California tech company culture. I want something that's informed by our history on the crypto side of like the benefits of a more permissionless open space. And um, so that just it seemed just like a really good opportunity for for the two of us to do this together. And that's that's the origin story. So, Peter, this question is specifically for you from Cosmo. Do you envision a Lamina One Metaverse Foundation similar to the Bitcoin Foundation? What, if so, what might that look like from a governance perspective? Yeah, so the, the Bitcoin Foundation started, it was the very first crypto foundation. And I knew when I started it that I wanted, like I had a couple goals. I wanted um, to provide salary for people like Gavin Andreessen and Peter Vuel and those folks who were like the Bitcoin core dev team. Um, <clears throat> they were all sort of like working out of their basements on the sufferance of their partners. And um, I thought it, it didn't seem right that they wouldn't have salary. And also it was like, they were also as the core devs, increasingly the focus of like media inquiries, government outreach, all this stuff. And I wanted to like make space for them to actually go build the tech without, uh, without having any kind of uh, political interruptions. And so, um, so we raised money for that. And, um, and that's sort of obviously now probably almost every layer one chain has got some kind of foundation in place. They look a little bit differently if you start them kind of before a chain is launched. And so I will say that I think we're building an open metaverse ecosystem here, kind of akin to the early days of Bitcoin. Um, and we will have a foundation. That foundation is going to be much, much more open than the Bitcoin foundation was and um, my intent is that kind of as quickly as possible, we'd pass off governance to the governance token for Lamina. So I think in that way, as you might imagine, something a little more like maybe Polkadot's governance setup or something like that. Um, that said, the foundation is going to be providing like grants for creatives, uh, engineering, you know, focal point for recruiting, biz dev. Um, and one thing we've started here that we haven't really built out, but I would really encourage people to get involved in is these working groups. So. Like early days in Bitcoin, 
many, many people made their careers jumping in on these foundation working groups for like legal and regulatory. That was a big one. Um, new tech, like at the time, Bitcoin was was more interested in incorporating outside tech into the protocol than it is now. Um, and a lot of just, you know, very, very large uh, careers, working groups, industries all started out of people getting involved in those working groups. So we're up for interesting ideas on other working groups. And, and I'm hoping in the next month or two, we'll be able to better build those out and like give give you guys, if you really want to dig in, a chance to kind of like help set our goal and our mission and where we're going with that stuff. Great. Um, thank you, Peter. So uh, Neil, now that you have joined, um, I think I'm going to start with the initial question that also went to Peter. And I know that people obviously would love to hear this from you directly. Um, what um, is the vision for Lamina One? And what were the sort of motivations inspiring its creation from your perspective? Uh, well, the um, if if we're going to have millions or even billions of people um, using the metaverse, then um, we need to uh, make it so that there's some experiences that they will enjoy having when they go there. And um, right now, the people who are good at creating those kinds of experiences typically work in the game industry. That's kind of a general statement. Um, so there's always going to be lots of exceptions. But in general, you know, if you ask the question, who's good at using three-dimensional uh, you know, spatial computing tool chains um, to, to build experiences that people enjoy having, um, you know, the, the answer is it's people who work in games. Increasingly, it's it's people who work in the motion picture or TV industry because those industries are adopting um, game industry tool chains more and more, uh, building things in, uh, in, in engines and so on. Um, <clears throat> so the question is, is going to be, you know, since since the the people we need, you know, to a large extent, are gainfully employed um, <clears throat> doing things um, uh, at existing uh, game projects and so on. You know, what can we provide in the way of economic opportunities and um, and and tool sets that uh, that um, makes working on the metaverse an attractive proposition for them? Um, and so, um, what we're trying to do with Lamina One is to to begin with lay down some of the economic rails that we think are going to be needed. Um, in order to um, to you know, provide a pathway for people to get compensated when something that they have a part in making uh, finds an audience and, and generates some some revenue. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and then um, that's kind of I, I would say the most basic way that I can describe it. And then on top of that and around that, if that works. Um, and becomes a sustainable proposition. There's all kinds of other things that we can uh, that we can layer on top of that and build around it. Um, but we're starting. Great. So uh, we have a question from Chris Califf. Um They write: Is Lamina One intended to be a full 3D metaverse of its own, or is it aiming more at the blockchain infrastructure to support other metaverse projects? The uh, you can like I think a way to think about this is in terms of different tiers of functionality. So at the at the so base level, it is a blockchain um, <clears throat> that does what blockchains do. Um, so you know there's going to be a basic suite of of uh, capabilities that uh, that come with any chain. Uh, on top of that, we want to layer some spatial computing. Um, capabilities as I was talking about um, and exactly how that turns into a metaverse or the metaverse you know is um, is something that we can kind of we can we can we can kind of try to steer that uh, but we can't dictate it uh, this is a going to be an open source thing all the way it's not going to be a centralized um, centrally controlled kind of project so um, we we want to make some uh, some some tools and some um, some 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 uh, some capabilities available to to metaverse builders um, 
so that they can do whatever they want to do, basically. Um, but uh, we also intend to um, create some some first party experiences, um, partly as a way to dog food uh, our own tool set, so we know we know whether it works or not, um, and um, partly as a way of of showing uh, what we think. Um, the, the the system is capable of uh, what we you know kind of aspire to in the way of building a, a cool metaverse. Yeah, I I just tag on there and say we're thinking of this as like um, you could build your own central land on top of Lamina. You could build your own you know sands. These are we want to be kind of an infrastructure layer that makes all that much much easier to do. Um, one of the things historically about a lot of those is, is like visually, they're maybe not very compelling. Um, and like, and as Neil often talks about the experience isn't necessarily super compelling for, for a lot of those. So, so, so we'll try and we want to lay some rails out and, and put some cool shit out. That's really awesome also, but, but it is in a service of giving all everybody this toolkits to, to go build the things they want to build. So from Jen, who is one of our original 1K members, um, this question was upvotes. Um, Wait, I want to say something. Right. I want to say something. I wasn't sure if I was going to be a 1K member, but I got it. I was really happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> happy you're part of the I group. was like, yes. Um, <laughs> totally. <laughs> um, okay, so they write, I'm worried about fragmentation. Why is another layer one blockchain necessary? Were any of the roll-up solutions for ETH or a sidechain considered? That's, that's probably for me to say. I mean, um, so like, there there are a couple angles to this. One is like, um, it would be nice if let's say that you ran, I don't know, um, well even ETH, but ETH's probably a little big. But let's say you let's say you run a so called L two fork of Ethereum. It would be wonderful if Neil were to be like, yeah, I'll build my metaverse there. Um, cause that would boost that chain so much. So another way to say that is like when we sat down, Neil and I looked at the landscape just of what's out there and how to drive value for everybody who wants to go on this ride with us. Like it didn't necessarily make sense to go boost an existing ecosystems token holders when we thought that like we could instead invite people who just want to do this with us. And then all of us could together benefit from that rather than like privileging, you know, whales on whatever, I don't know. So one of these layer two so so there's there's just kind of that i mean a, another way to say it is like i actually think like zuck spent 10 billion dollars last year you could argue a lot of that was misspent um uh or you could be like this dude's a smart dude and he knows what he's doing either way like a kind of small side project on an existing chain to me is not going to have the economic heft it needs to really do a good job like there's just a lot to do there are a lot of participants there's a there's a lot of resources people need who want to do this and so to me like it just makes all the sense in the world like we'd build a community we'd have the full economic resources of a full l1 um and i actually think i don't worry about so-called fragmentation that way i actually think the futures I'm, I'm like totally post-maximalist and think futures just like a dense mesh network of these chains that get better and better at like proving data and value transfer across from them. So I don't even think that's like a bad outcome. Then. So to continue on from Loftoid, um, so how will Lambda One actually differentiate itself from its saturated pool of competitors? I think I that's, mean, yeah, this is more ahead, Peter, Peter stuff. Hey, so. You're like Utah, you say it, Peter. I mean, yeah. are, there, are there a lot of competitors? There's like, there's like, Financing pools from Avalanche, Solana is like not going to be the metaverse. I don't really know that we have any uh, godfathers of inventors of the metaverse building out with the very, very best teams across spatial gaming and crypto competitors. I'm not sure that we do. So I'm not super worried about it. I think our job is just to get get you guys the tools you need, experiences you need, marketing support you need, engineering support you need. Get you guys all that stuff, and and then we'll see where we go together. That's really the the thing. There's another kind of angle on this sort of question, which um, sort of 
I, I don't know if it's relevant, but but this this emerges from the experience of being a, a novelist specifically, and um, you know you can drive yourself crazy and never never accomplish anything if you sit there and try to read all of the other novels you know if you if you construe all of the other books and all of the other writers as competition uh and, and you 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 have to have this starting attitude that um that you can't do anything unless you've somehow accounted for everyone you you see as mm. as a competitor in the space you will never do anything at all um, it's just just the sheer amount of effort it takes to stay in touch with with that landscape <clears throat> it precludes doing any creative work. So um, you pretty much have to decide what you want to do and do it. <clears throat> and, um, and then, and then kind of let the, the chips fall where they may. I mean, I guess it's saying like, it's, it's either really humble or really arrogant or both to be like, okay, well, I guess I'll try and do something right. Rather than just be like, someone else must be working on that. So here's one from Erasmus. Where did the name Lamina One actually come from? It's a uh, a name that uh, it's a word. Obviously, it's an old word that just means layer. Um, so it's apropos in this particular um, context because we're building a layer one chain. Uh, but it was a word that was kind of bouncing around in the wake of some uh, creative work that my team and I did at, uh, at, at Magic Leap, um, where we had kind of used it in a different context. Um, and so it was kind of in the air. And when we were looking for possible, uh, possible names for the new project, it just ended up in the bucket and we ended up um, deciding uh, that it was a good pick. Also, it's animal spilled backwards. <laughs> Sit in my head. I mean, I am. And Isn't aren't all naming stories really boring? I think we were like, oh, this will be the placeholder, and we'll probably have to rename it. And then we were like, nope, we have to launch. So this is what it's called now. But uh, I like it. I'm pro. Um. So next question from Daniel Trujillo: um, What methods of carbon sequestration are going to be used and implemented and incentivized by Lamina One? So the uh, there's um there's a few hundred schemes on the market for uh, carbon credits and huge range of variation in what kinds of technologies they use you know some of them are are planting trees some of them are trying to directly sequester carbon um, some of them are are a lot more abstract and kind of indirect and um so um and and some of them are more legit than others, uh, and it's not an easy task to to evaluate all of those and figure out which ones are are best. Um, the um, like it would be nice if you could just sort of make an obvious judgment call on which was the most legit. But in fact, for most of them, you actually have to do some serious research and thinking and kind of quantitative evaluation in order to uh, have a, a, an informed opinion about whether it's a good scheme or not. So there's actually multiple rating entities that, um, that actually do that work. They actually, their, their job is to sit and evaluate these different um, schemes and, um, and sort of rate them as to how effective they are, how legit they are. Um, and so, um, so I guess that's a way of saying that um, the uh, we don't think it would be uh, a wise approach to just pick one and say this is this is the 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 one that we're going to use um, um, because um, because that requires a lot of effort and it um, and you know the answer might change over time. Um, so basically, we intend to work with. Uh, a, a rating group that um, is very well informed about this stuff and a essentially whitelist specific um, schemes that according to their research are are good ones um, and then um, 
beyond that, I mean, P Peter could maybe talk about how to to implement it. Uh, you know, in terms of of uh, of the node uh, the node agreement that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Although I'll I'll just tag tag you back, Neil, for a second and say I think it's fair to say um, we actually really want people who want to work on this uh, talking to us. So if you're interested, drop us a line. I think hello at lamina one dot com is easy. Um, and and uh, we could use a carbon czar in house actually, um, like just for some range on some of the the quality stuff. Neil was saying like. You could buy a ton of CO2 sequestration from $2 to like $2,000, depending on like this huge array of variables. So our intent right now is to have a set of tokens issued on Lamina that will conform to like a minimum grade in partnership with a rating agency. And then they'll be, they'll be burned by node operators based on a, a schedule and a calculation as part of the consensus mechanism. So they'll, you'll need to actually have some of them and burn them to, to even get rolling. And I think we, why I say we need someone is like, there's still quite a bit of legwork to be done to like decide maybe community wide, maybe internally we'll make a suggestion for the community, but like what, what grade do we actually need? Like what are the, what are the qualities of the, of the carbon credits that we're going to tokenize and make available uh, in this way for, sequestration is called re retirement in the carbon credit market so drop us a line if you're interested like we'd really like someone who who's super interested in that uh to help so the next question is from mike mandel so for game developers and creators interested in using lamina one in their projects what do you expect the early capabilities of your sdk to be will you be targeting engines like unity and unreal early on we're, we we are totally targeting whatever game developers actually use in their day to day work. Um, so, from, based on that, you can you can probably guess you know what the first highest priority targets are are going to be. So this is not a, an attempt to try to swerve existing experienced developers onto some kind of new system. It's it's a we're, we're going to work within existing engines and and tools um to uh to make this as as easy and and painless as possible yeah it, it'll uh, be well and just to expand on that a little bit neil's yes in the answer to i think we can say we're intending to do unity and unreal um extensions dev kits we actually have tony parisi here who i might call up to tony can we are you talkable can we drag you up to say a thing or two about that yeah, we'll see if he, he can we'll add himself to the stage. Let's see. I can invite him too. I just invited him. Uh, um, great. Uh, he's up up front now. Um, while he's getting his mic sorted. Um, I will, Hello. Oh, hey. I was, uh, I'll say one thing and then I'll pass pass to you. So for us, like the very first, the way I imagine the first versions of these toolkits is there are going to be some hooks that are like right in the, the experience creator's workflow. They give access to like some of the key parts of the chain. Some of that stuff you might see in other toolkits, like NFTs, digital object, persistent digital objects, state storing state on the chain, um, and then some will be related to us, like support for this proof of integration, connectivity, and stuff. So you could start getting paid during the during the node consensus for the work you're doing. So, with that, Tony, what are our plans? Yeah, I mean, I'll just. Uh... Uh, elaborate on bo what both you and Neil were talking about. Um, first of all, yeah, we're not trying to kind of steer people into other workflows away from where they are today. And when it comes to uh, premium game content um, and, you know, other like say, high end entertainment content, those workflows are squarely in the Unreal and Unity engine realm. Uh, for other use cases, because, you know, this, this uh, open metaverse that we're all building together is going to be used for more than just gaming. There's going to be a lot of demand for uh, web-based stuff, and I've got no small amount of experience there. And so we're also going to create web SDKs. And as Peter said, um, you know, we're going to start kind of small and modest by being able to allow developers to mint objects on our chain, trade them, do all the things you would do with NFTs, but in, in the Lamina one way with proof of integration. So it's going to start there with some modest set of development milestones that plug into these 
current workflows. But over time, uh, you know, this is going to evolve as we see what, you know, how the use cases play out and uh, which particular engine needs are, you know, being uh, realized by developers as new things are being built. You know, so Peter had said earlier, you could build your own decentral land with a blockchain like this. Well, the blockchain part of it is one thing, but, you know, how do you integrate that into a working, thriving uh, virtual universe with potentially millions of citizens in it? Uh, that could create new needs for more workflow tools. That's like um, next right? month, Tony. That's, yeah, I know, that's exactly, like in November. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny and it's so ironic. I'm I'm doing, personally, being at this for pushing 30 years now, I am finding that I'm going through all the pile of all the ideas we have as we're discussing this stuff, Peter, and, and interacting with the community so early and simplifying, simplifying, simplifying and kind of trying to come up with the tiniest possible MVP. Yeah which is yeah, yeah, yeah. so counterintuitive to, to the way I personally operate, but is you know, kind of where we have to be right now in order to be able to focus and get anything out the door, right? So it's, it's a, a personally uh, challenging task right now, and I look forward to when we can staff up. And uh, I don't know, I can do the big dreamer stuff a little bit more and get other people focused on MVP milestones. But for now, yeah, we got to start really small. But eventually, we're going to get to some of those bigger things. Thanks, Tony. Before you hop off, you mentioned staffing up. Are there any particular roles you want to recruit for that you want to mention here? Yeah. So in case, and, and I'm, uh, I apologize, I missed the first five minutes of this because I had my Discord tab muted. I kept going to my settings, but I just had the tab muted because Discord couldn't be so noisy. So you may have covered some of this in the first five minutes. But nope, um, in, in, in addition to the layer one chain, you know, there's really two other major components to what we think we need to you know, realize, and we're not going to build all this, this part ourselves. I'm going to one. The chain is going to be on us. But Metaverse is a service set of distributed, decentralized system services that power virtual worlds at some level. Um, and again, we're not going to reinvent all those. Every game company that's got, you know, back-end game tech's got something out there already. So we're going to help our node operators and creators figure out best-in-class solutions to being able to create and operate a distributed virtual world. Um, so we need a lead on Metaverse as a service. That's kind of like a system architect role, someone who can go through, look at all the technologies out there, vet them, come up with some recommendations so we can start engaging with those companies that make this tech as partners, and then possibly find uh, gaps in this and you know potentially build some things ourselves, but I doubt we're going to do much of that ourselves. And then the uh, you know to go along with that, the S SDK stuff we talked about, um, we're going to need a couple of people right away building SDK support, even for the basic object mining. So I think we need a dev lead and a you know, hands-on coder, you know, a couple of folks to help us there. So uh, we haven't posted the official job postings yet. Uh, give me a couple more days, but we'll get those out there on our uh, LinkedIn job site in the next week or so. Cool. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Um... So there have been a couple of questions about Avalanche, asking about what our relationship to Avalanche is, and specifically the fact that we plan to fork Avalanche. The question is, why does it need a fork? What do you plan to change? change and why can't it just run on Avalanche itself? Yeah, that sounds like um, that sounds like all me. Unless <laughs> you you want to feel this one, Neil? No. <laughs> so. <I'll> um, <clears throat> So this, the social history is I've known Goon for a really, really long time. Uh, who's the um, the uh, first time he came to my notice was with the Selfish Mining paper when I was at the Bitcoin Foundation. And just a brilliant systems theorist, brilliant, decent, you know, distributed compute theorist, a very good person on top of it. And, and, um, and he and I re-intersected during the Dow hack era as like the... Um, just on the security research side. Uh, so, so he and I are, have been friends for a long time. Um, Avalanche, I think I would say right now, Snowman consensus, which is the current Avalanche consensus, is the best consensus mechanism. Um, I had talked earlier about this um, idea that uh, this idea that like I view a densely interconnected set of chains as the kind of rational next step and an important one. And I think that Avalanche has is like part of the way there with their sub network and. So we want to support. We want to support what's happening there. Um, I think forking Avalanche, I would say, was a possibility. I'm not going to promise that we're doing that right now. Um, I think it's also possible that the right thing to do will be building in some compatibility layers, especially for subnet providers on Avalanche who want to represent their state with us and and have us give the tools on on Lamina if you want to represent your state back on Avalanche to do all that. So. 
so to my mind, like, um, I think we're, we are still figuring that out. And we, we really actually do need some more senior blockchain engineering folks in to s- sit down and, and, and look seriously at this. Um, and um, so I think a, a range of things from a fork, but one in which over time we architect, um, we kind of like harden Avalanche and decompose some of its, some of its components, like, like, the, like pulling out stuff like node messaging consensus into its own modules that could get hardened and be a little more stable. That's one possible path. Um, and a path that would get us up and running quickly, but also let us kind of build out in a sane way going forward. As to like, why not just use Avalanche other than what I was saying before about community, um, all of this other stuff around the economics for our community versus Avalanche's wonderful existing community. I think the other thing is is just that um, we have some stuff we want to do that's not going to be doable at the smart contract. And if if and if you talk to the Avalanche engineering team, who's um, um, amazingly smart, um, they'll be like, look, we're booked with work like through next year. I mean, like they're very busy. So, so, so we also just like, you're not going to be able to wedge in the spatial compute support, the real virtual real estate support, all the stuff that you might want on the solidity side or some other way with Avalanche. So like we, we really do need access to the whole layer one tech stack to build out what we want to build out. So anyway, that's the history, but Avalanche is great. I think they're, we think they're fantastic. And I think are very hopeful. We'll have a really good long-term partnership with them. Great. So uh, Neil, this question is for you. This is from Moon. When you say open, this <laughs> this is not a small one. When you say open metaverse, what does that actually mean to you? Do you have a plan to engage the open source community, develop in the open and or use open standards? Uh, well, yeah, all um, the, uh, the, the sort of blockchain world runs on open source. It's the only way to, to do anything in, in, in the blockchain sort of universe. Uh, and so what we're doing will be, be no exception. You can't, you can't really be taken seriously uh, in that world unless, um, unless you're doing things open source. <clears throat> and so um, at the very basic level, um, you know, this is going to be a, an open source project. Um, and then in terms of, um, you know, what the metaverse itself looks like, um, you know, um, as I said before, we intend to do some leading by example, I hope, by by making um, some experiences that we happen to think are really cool, but um, there's no possibility, there's no version of this story in which we're telling everybody what to do or, you know, imposing any kind of top-down um, development scheme uh, on on what happens. Uh, it has to be a, a bottom-up kind of uh, phenomenon, uh, which means, um, you know, empowering a lot of people to build what they want to build um, and um, and then seeing, you know, what what works, what what succeeds, uh, and what doesn't. Um, that's, you know, that's a, 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 a characteristic of a lot of creative um, marketplaces, whether it's publishing or indie game development or indie film development. Um, you know, there's, um, there's always this constant kind of ferment um, that's very broad based of, of, individual creators or small groups of creators um, building what they want to build. Um, and um, and you never know, like part of the excitement of working in those industries is that you never know when something is suddenly going to break out um, and sort of come out of nowhere and, um, and become a big, a big hit. Um, so that's, I guess, my general picture of how this is all going to look. I don't know if that's responsive to the the question but uh, Neil do you think one thing I think about openness is like back to these walled garden platforms like um, controlling payments controlling market participants um, so in my mind open sort of lift does some lift there too what do you think about that like just culturally communities all of all of that side too like does that is that on your mind when when you say open metaverse or is that more my world and you're not as worried about it um <clears throat> what's the can you repeat it what's the um 
the, the yeah i guess i mean like i was saying like when i say open metaverse to me i'm thinking about um really like rather than controls around who uses it opt-in mechanisms for people you know so it's open you can pay people directly you can pay smart contracts um we don't have to have a an epic account to get Fortnite bucks or something on lamina um it, so it's open com- culturally and in a community sense more i'm thinking about that but i was just curious if that's important to you as well or if the stuff you were saying was like more kind of top of your mind well i think i think those two kind of naturally go together um <clears throat> you know if if you're um if you're trying to have that open uh creative market place that I was talking about that kind of open square where people can all you know try to to, to build their own systems build their own dreams then um, um I don't think you can get there without um without sort of a uh literal currency you know that um that is how people exchange value in that world. yeah I I hear you that makes sense I guess it might be a good place to talk about privacy too, but we can maybe we can. I don't want to take you off your your questions there, Margo. Um, there's definitely a bunch of questions related to privacy. I there's one that I wanted to dovetail off of for both of you, and then maybe we move into privacy. So, based upon what you're talking about with community and open source and attracting people, one of the questions was: with so many platforms vying for creators and developers, you know, it can be hard to attract premium, high quality content that will keep users on the platform. Um, how will Lamina's platform be particularly attracted to the creator community um, and specifically from a monetization perspective? What's exciting about the platform for creators, essentially? We just want to build the the tool set that that the creators would most like to see um, and um, um, and and support support them as as best we can. Um, I, I don't know how to say it any more straightforwardly than, than that. I mean, Neil's kind of humble. I mean, I think getting to build alongside Neil's pretty exciting and build where he's building. Um, I think, but the other thing too, and this gets back to like why a full layer one, like we're, we intend to bring the full resources of a layer one chain precisely to make all the content creators lives better. So um, again, engineering support, marketing, uh we intend to have an ecosystem fund so direct venture investment and other investment and experiences like we're really we really are trying to like take however many billions of dollars the chain may be worth someday and like point it all at getting this thing launched like that is the goal so yeah so i don't know hopefully that'll be appealing to creators i think it should be and uh, sorry go ahead um, you did raise the question now, Peter, about uh, privacy. And of course, there were a bunch of questions within the AMAs. I'm trying to find the specific ones, but there were lots of people asking about privacy and, you know, how we'll handle handling privacy sort of on, on the platform. And so do you want to speak to that? I'm trying to yeah, yeah, find I, the I'll exact just, question. Maybe I'll just put out a philosophy. This is sort of like an area that Bitcoin and ETH diverged from each other on, which is on like... Um, just how important is it to be private uh, on these chains or to have the option for privacy when people want it? And I think, um, you know, I will say sort of like, especially in the, in the ZK snark world, I mean, we, you know, in the zero knowledge proof world, there's a, there are a lot of like interesting scalability type solutions, speed solutions that also add back some privacy that people on Ethereum virtual EVM type, chains have lost that you know um and so like i i think it's important it's a there's a there's a class of there are a class of interactions that um people should be able to do i believe on the internet privately and and there are a lot of things people may really want to be able to prove their own identity or prove some things about their identity like i'm an accredited investor or i don't live in a certain state or you know, or um, I'm definitely a journalist or, you know, you could imagine really a lot of different use cases. So I really just from my own DNA have an interest in kind of like building something that's a little bit new, maybe a synthesis of those of those worlds where, you know, in, a, in, a, in very broad strokes, Bitcoiners think there shouldn't be probably any identity 
on on chain for Bitcoin at all. ETH folks are like, bro, why worry? Just write all your letters on postcards and stop worrying about it. I think there's probably somewhere in the middle that is better for society. And so we will try to provide those tools. And, and that's that's most likely going to be on some of this like modern, very, very modern kind of black magic crypto side. Um, and so like we're inspired by chains like Espresso and others that are really kind of um, and the, the Stark Labs, like people who are doing really, really good stuff in that area. And we'll try to bring some of that in. Um, great. So a couple of questions around coins. Is, is Lamb on One expected to have a coin of its own? And if so, will it be possible to invest in land or other assets? Yeah, so so we'll definitely have a layer one token. It's called the L1 token. Um, I am sure, you know, because of what we said, like many, many projects on Lamina One will definitely have land tokens and other things that they'll want to sell you or do all the creative things people do with them. So I'm sure there will be that. Um, I would like for some of our first party content to have ownable digital objects of some sort. I think that that's really Neil's world and um, he could... He could probably at best speculate right now, but I can let him do that in a second. Um, we have not planned on running an ICO for Lamina One or anything like that. We're, um, we've, we feel that investors, institutional investors will provide us the capital to get launched and that will free us up to do more along the lines of airdropping, providing incentives, direct, direct incentives baked into the node protocols. All of this other stuff is like ways for people to get to get tokens. And so like what we're really sort of inviting people to come along to is like, just come along for the ride and, um, and we'll get, we'll, that's our current plan. So I don't, I don't know exactly what the future holds right now, but um, this isn't sort of like leading up to some, some large ICO in our minds right now. Yeah. We'd like to see, Neil, value, we'd like to see the value of the token emerge from it's actually being used as a currency to to buy and sell goods and you know those goods are going to be digital goods but they're they're goods nonetheless um and um and and not just from um from from speculation per se yeah totally uh, here's Here's a question from someone in northern Europe how can I contribute how can I be part can I set up a node maybe? I mean, Northern Europe's a great place to contribute from. You could definitely set up nodes. I think we're pretty sure we're going to have a few kinds of nodes right now. So I think it's likely we'll have consensus nodes, obviously, against Snowman. But we'll probably also have file storage nodes and render rendering nodes, stuff that could do some distributed rendering. That's all. The consensus nodes will be earlier, but and file storage might be earlier than this. But like rendering's definitely into next year, I would be stunned if it were earlier than that um so that's one way i think if you're if if you you know have an interest in any of these working groups you can get involved there if you want to come work for us we would you know definitely hire high quality candidates from from wherever you're from and you can you, even if there's no job posting you can drop us line and be like this you know i want to work on this tell us what you want to work on and all that's really helpful so um lo lots of ways I, I think we will have more touch points you know, we're sort of five weeks out from launch or something right now. So we'll have more touch points over the next month or two for ways to get involved as well. So Neil, this question is for you from Cosmo. So how does Neil's vision of the metaverse and the world in which it existed in 1992 compare to today? What kind of changes and compromises must be made? Uh, the, at, the, at the time that I wrote the book, um, the game industry as we know it today lay in the future right so i mean there were there were arcade games um but sort of the the doom which we you know rightly or wrongly we kind of think of as the first kind of 3d game uh came along a few years later and and you know led to um, the game industry as we know it today and that's what drove that became the economic driver of um that that caused the uh the cost of hardware to go down to the point where now almost anyone can afford a really powerful graphics card and it led to the creation of the 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 software ecosystem that that supports the whole industry so the, the creation of modern game engines and and the associated 
um, tools that people use to feed assets into those those engines. So that's the big difference uh, between then and now. Um, <clears throat> the um, um, and so if I were you know rewriting it today, um, that's you know, that's the the different spin that I would that I would probably put on it. Um, the um, the the really interesting thing that's been happening, particularly in the last few years, is that um, social uh, behavior and social interaction is starting to become a more and more important part of of games. And so, um, you know, um, I mean, that's been going on since games started to become multiplayer. Um, but um, um, it's it's within the last few years that we've seen, for example, in Fortnite, that it's just become a place where people will go to hang around with their friends and actually playing the game is really a, a secondary uh, kind of consideration um, compared to um, to just being there and, and chatting with your your friends. Um, so um, and th that's all stuff that um, um, is kind of non obvious that um, has just sort of emerged from millions of people interacting with each other on the internet over the, the last few years. Um, and so um, I suspect that what we're going to end up seeing, you know, as as the, the metaverse develops is is a lot of that, a lot of of experiences that kind of straddle the, the boundary between games um, as we normally think of games and just social hanging around with your with your your buddies. That's my hot take on that. <laughs> but the next question, I the, the next question I was going to ask, kind of dovetails on what you're just saying there. What you're just saying there, Neil. Someone had said more specifically, how will Lam going to connect people in a way that's different from what the known established social media platforms like Facebook are actually doing today? And you just touched upon that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I I think that social interaction goes better when you've got something to do. Um, and um, so, um, I mean, if you look at how people behave in the real world, sometimes they'll get together just for, they'll do nothing but sit in a chair next to each other and, and talk. So people do do that, but it's more common to say, hey, let's go to a movie or let's, you know, let's go play miniature golf. Let's go swimming, you know, let's go out to eat. And so you're, you're you know, you're hanging your social interaction on top of some kind of mutually enjoyable activity. Um, and, um, you know, this is like classically kind of a guy thing to do is, is you know, I have to, um, I have to, you know, fix my car or something like that. <clears throat> or, you know, let's go play, let's go, let's go play shoot hoops together or something. Um, so, um, <clears throat> you know, I'm not saying that uh, other platforms aren't doing this, but um, I I do think that um, that there's huge potential in this idea that you um, that you create experiences that are kind of kind of fun and interesting in their own right, but um, that provide enough kind of uh, flexibility and open bandwidth that while you're doing them. Or while you're just kind of spectating on them, you can also be hanging around and and socializing with your friends. Great. So a question uh, probably for Peter. Um, will Lamina One, in addition to using existing real time engines, will you develop your own? Um, we do not have any intent to uh, develop our own engine. I think that's. In probably somewhere between foolhardy and truly insane. Um, just the amount of money companies like and not know how and talent companies like Epic or or Unity have put into these things is is you know crazy. Um, we had Tony Preci on stage earlier, who just actually left Unity as head of uh, AR or VR there. So so we do uh, we do have like access to some of the talent that's engaged in those places. Um, I will say, like, we are toying with, I don't know, maybe we're past toying and starting to think we should commit to the idea that we would put resources into more, like, web-related viewers and experience viewing. So this isn't on the creation side, but on the 
like how people experience it, trying to trying to democratize these metaverse experiences is something we're sort of trying to figure out if we if we think we could we could really make a good crack at and and make a difference in. So um, that's an area sort of like adjacent to these engines, but that's kind of even that we're tr- we're still deciding if that's too ambitious or not. I would say. Um, someone's asking a question, Chaz, about digital goods. Will it be possible to sell digital goods in whatever file format we desire and be able to stream, download it directly into the metaverse? Um, into a metaverse instance for the player to spawn? Yeah, so, yeah, there's a lot there. I'll say a couple <laughs> things that maybe you'll look into. The, the, um, so, and actually, Tony is someone who co-created the standard GLTF, which is what's used for metaverse stuff now. So, we're not intending to be like um, someone who's creating our own standards for experiences. Um, we probably will end up, and this is on the spatial side, privileging some existing standards and encouraging people to use them. There are kind of a lot of qu- questions, like a really simple one, like say you want some object portability between games. Well, even just like your units between these games have to be the same. And Neil could talk about a lot of this from Assignment Magic League too. So shaders, textures, all this stuff. So there's a lot there and I don't want to get over my skis. It's like not really my world, but I I could say like from the very top level, the mandate I put out to the team is to, is to like support what wants to be done, um, what, what developers and engineers want to do and have as minimal a set of specifications as we can get away with to, to help that happen. Um, I don't know, Neil, do you want to talk about your Magic Leap experience on some of this stuff? I think it's super relevant. Well, yeah, I don't know how, if this is really specific to Magic Leap, but the, um, you know, um, there, there's this general topic has become a real uh, source of, of, uh, of uh, social media hostility over the last winter um, kind of between crypto bros and, and game devs. Um, the, the idea of, of interoperability and moving objects, you know, from one game to another, uh, which um, if you, you know, the more you know basically about how games work and what goes into developing them, the more ridiculous that idea seems. Um, and so, um, it's, I think it's led to a situation sometimes where game devs feel that they're being uh, disrespected or that nobody understands what they actually do for a living. Um, so um, I, I, I think, you know, I could talk about this for a long time, but the gist of it is that it takes a lot of work to, um, to sort of somehow adapt a, a, an object um, that was created in one game and somehow get it to work in a different game even if that makes sense uh, a lot a lot of times it doesn't even make sense um, but to the extent that it takes work to the extent that somebody has to redo the shaders or redo the artwork or um, or rewrite the scripts that cause it to interact in a appropriate way with other elements of the game um, uh, um, those contributions you know, need to be of registered on some kind of a chain of, of provenance attached to that object so that they have some hope of actually getting compensated um, if and when that object gets gets picked up and used. Well, um, we have, uh, we're just about at time, everybody. We've got, uh, it's about 11.57. Um, Trying to think of a question that can be a quick a quick last question. There's lots of very long and and uh, hmm. Let's see. Let me see if I can come up with one last question that we can give to the team. We can um, we can just risk yeah. it with Kuroro here. Kuroro is uh. Want to do you want to do, uh, do you wanna roll the dice and take a live question? Um. Yeah, I didn't actually. Yeah, no, I it's am... not really. Okay, I'll do it. Yeah, I'll do it. Oh, there's, there's... yeah we can, we can get we can uh, go ahead and do that. Okay, so I'm gonna. I'm, gonna, go. I'm uh, sorry, Carrera. Oh. I'm gonna pull EJ because they're a one K member like I am, and I'm privileging them. Oh, they're gone. They're oh. both gone. Oh no! Oh, EJ, Here's oh, EJ. EJ's back. Okay, all right. I invited EJ up. Okay, great. Hello, fellow fellow one K badge holder. Thank you. 
How's it going? Good. Hey, what's up? Um, I want to ask a question. Um, um, uh, it has to do something with uh, the book Snow Crash. I just um ordered it because I had there was a lot of people telling me to buy it because it's very good. There's something that uh, I have been hearing quite a bit. It's called the Black Sun, and I kind of wanted to ask, um, what is the Black Sun, and, and if anything, does it have any correlation over on Lamina on the on the blockchain? Yeah, so the Black Sun in um, in the book Snow Crash is the cool spot. Um, you know, it's the studio. Well, I'm going to date myself and say it's like the Studio 54. It probably means nothing <laughs> to 90 percent of the people here, but it's like the cool spot that everyone wants to get into and see and be seen. It's got bouncers outside the door. Um, and it's where a lot of important interactions happen early in the book between uh, people who are important to the, the plot. Um, so, you know, <clears throat> um, whether or not the Black Sun per se gets realized under that name um, in what we're building um, remains to be seen. There's a lot of questions about about the, the rights um, and so on. And what might happen in the way of possible movie or, or television adaptations. Um, but fortunately, as I keep reminding people, <clears throat> I'm the one person who's qualified to actually come up with new ideas um, uh, in this world. Um, and so, um, and I've actually got some. So, um, the uh, some some of these ideas, like the black sun and the street, are things I. I invented in about 15 minutes 30 years ago. Um, and uh, you, you may have had some ideas since then. You may yeah, have stayed I mean, good at making up things. Right, right. So, um, so uh, whether or not the Black Sun as such shows up under that name, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to say that uh, we, we intend to, to bring some other experiences into the metaverse uh, that are, you know, authored uh, by me and that, um, you know, reflect uh, things that have happened and things that I've learned in the last 30 years. Um, <laughs> Mic drop. He's, he's here. He's just, we got you. Hello? What do you want hello? to know? Yeah. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Can yeah. you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, oh. So, uh, um thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk but i'm sorry i don't have very good news uh, because uh i ha i'm gonna say that this was an, a bit of a over generic uh, uh ma and i'm gonna say most of the answer you gave is the very particular and uh, the uh, very important topics were a bit too generic and brushed over for my taste. <laughs> so instead so of since, asking hey, you Kuro, five... Since we're, at, since we're at time, like if you, do you want to give us one question that you want yeah, some more yeah, deep just, specific on? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I'm getting there. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm not going to take the time. So instead of taking your time, could you repeat when was the launch? Because I didn't have the time to understand was it was in five months or five weeks? Yeah, so we launched um, like a couple days before consensus, the Thursday before consensus, uh, which was uh, early June. Margo, do you have the exact date? Are you, are you oh, I mean, the about, next yes. launch. Yep. Are you talking about the launch of the chain or the announcement? Yes. Yes. When you can give a so, bit more detailed and clear information uh, about yeah, yeah. So, uh, everything yeah, so, else. Yeah, exactly. So the the next, so I don't know the date that we'll put a test net up for testing, but it will definitely all that information will be in the Discord. And we're, um, like I said, we're just sort of pulling community together, finishing up recruiting, finishing our seed round, and and trying to also land the ship on the two technology sides, spatial and blockchain. So we'll have a we'll have like the very first time you'll be able to download code, run try and run a test net node, start engaging with us. Like we will be all over discord telling people how to get involved with that but we don't have a date for you right now well my question is when we can get much more clear information because you are going for very information about uh, engines blocks and currency that are very generic even compared to other 
spatial VR metaverse or whatever you want to call them so much that, uh, yeah, it feels very, it feels like this project was prepared five years ago, but is not put up to standard with the new technology, new companies that we have right now. Well, I feel excited about what we're going to do, but I, I respect your opinion. I think if you want to help, probably the best thing to do would be pop in uh, maybe general and start asking some of these exact questions and we'll try and fill out. And some of the time we're just going to have to say, we don't know yet. We're still working on it. Um, sometimes we might have a lot more detail that just, you know, wouldn't be appropriate for, for, uh, for this style chat. But um, yeah, I think with there we'll probably end, but, but do engage, like help, help us get better and ask the questions that you got for sure. We'd love to hear them. Thank, thank you. Thank you. I, I did want to say one last thing on behalf of uh, Neil and uh, Peter. Um, we wanted to thank everybody for coming to our very first AMA and to commemorate this this sort of momentous occasion. Just I guess Peter said, just you know, four and a half, four weeks after we've launched the announcement of the or we, we've announced the launch of the chain, we're going to uh, be doing a commemoration uh, badge. So everybody who has participated here and everybody who has asked questions in the AMA. Um, next week, you will find a commemorative badge um, of our very first AMA um, in your account. So we're very thrilled that you all um, took the time to get involved and to join us here. And we're really excited to have um, just kicked off with our first AMA. Thanks, um, you guys. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, thanks, thanks for all. Yeah. Thank you, everybody.